From the Oregon State University Extension Service, this is Pollination, a podcast that tells the stories of researchers, land managers, and concerned citizens making bold strides to improve the health of pollinators. I'm your host, Dr. Adoni Melithopoulos, Assistant Professor in Pollinator Health in the Department of Horticulture. Developing pollinator habitat on working lands, things like managed forests or farms or rangelands, often involve expenses and technical expertise that might not be part of the operation. And that's where uh, programs developed by the Natural Resources Conservation Service come in. Now, it, uh, NRCS has a range of programs that are adaptable to pollinators. And whenever I have questions about those programs, the first person I call is Mace Vaughn. Now, Mace is the Xerces Society Pollinator and Agricultural Biodiversity Program Lead. And in this episode, he's going to walk us through the origins of NRCS and how those programs that are uh, put out by this federal agency and administered at a very local level can be um, can be used for pollinator habitats. So if you ever wondered about NRCS or if you're somebody who's looking to uh, make some investments in pollinator habitat, this episode is for you. So this week, Pollinator Habitat and NRCS with Mace Vaughn. This is very long overdue. I am so excited to welcome Mace Vaughn to the Pollination Podcast. Welcome. Thanks, Anthony. It's great to be here. I've, you know, I, you know, everywhere I turn, I often see you at meetings, and you're, you have a really broad scope to your program. So um, you, today we're going to narrow down, but I'm, I'm always excited to have a conversation with you. Um, and that goes both ways. Um, I really yeah, enjoyed watching you move like move into Oregon State and build this program that you've got on the ground. It's I mean, it's fantastic. So, yeah, this is great to be able to talk and catch up and share some of my work with with uh, your listeners. This is really fun. Now, one conversation I remember with you in particular, I've had a couple of these is understanding uh, the natural uh, resource conservation service and its connection to pollinators. And, you know, uh, Frequently, you've had to go over this material a couple of times. And what I hope to accomplish in this episode is for listeners to kind of get a glimpse into that conversation. So maybe to begin with, can you uh, describe uh, what the NRCS is and the basic premise under which it supports farmers to invest in conservation? Yeah. OK. Yeah, let's start there. Um so the natural, so you under the U.S. Department of Agriculture, there is a federal agency um, called the Natural Resources Conservation Service. The key, the the key responsibility for the NRCS um, is to help administer the most of the technical. I'm sorry, most of the conservation programs that are defined and funded under the U.S. Farm Bill. So there's the Farm Bill is this huge piece of legislation that we might come back to and talk a little bit more about um, that funds everything from uh, you know, protecting farmers and giving farmers insurance and security uh, to conservation, to um, food aid assistance for low-income families. Um, just there are a number of different pieces under the Farm Bill that relate to food production in the U.S. and conservation is a big piece of it. So the NRCS um, administers and provides technical assistance, and that's key, I'll come back to that, for all of the conservation programs under the Farm Bill. As one complicated aside, there's another agency called the Farm Service Agency that works you know, closely with farmers, um, uh, much more on the production side. They administer a program called the Conservation Reserve Program, where for that program, the Farm Service Agency administers funds, but NRCS provides technical support. And when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about these different programs in a moment. But NRCS is this agency. It's at the heart of this. They're providing the bulk of that technical support. They're providing a lot of financial assistance to those folks who, li who live and work on working lands. So farmland, rangeland, private forests, also tribal lands. Um, they're there to provide and administer uh, several programs, conservation programs that are funded under the Farm Bill. And that's really the heart of what they do. One other point is they are based out of what are usually county-based 
USDA service centers. So most counties in the U.S. have a service center where your NRCS conservation planner and there and maybe some other support staff from NRCS where they're based. And that's where one would go if you were a farmer, rancher, forest manager, tribal um, tribal member, et cetera, to add, begin to start that process of, of looking for that conservation planning support. So that's the NRCS overall. You know, I'm always amazed because, you know, oftentimes we think in the extension service, we cover the counties uh, really well. And in many cases we do. But I'm always amazed at how many staff members there are, for example, in the state of Oregon and how widely spread they are through the counties. They are a real resource at the county level for anybody doing conservation work. I think that's right. And in fact, in many cases, and I think this is, has been really smart, a lot of times cooperative, like cooperative extension has been in the same office or very close at hand to the NRCS and maybe the conservation district, which is a more of a private entity, a little more locally based, you know, the conservation districts are not tied to the federal agency of the NRCS, but they often work in partnership. And a lot of times the Farm Service Agency, NRCS, Cooperative Extension, Conservation Districts, they they have often been in the same place, which frankly is a great model because of how much they can support each other. Fantastic. Well, now, I so you mentioned um, uh, the Conservation Reserve Program. Uh, as one kind of program that comes out of the farm bill. But I know NRCS specifically has a number of programs that a farmer can plug into. uh, And some of them can be a little complicated to understand. So I wondered if you could in broad strokes for uh, give us a uh, NRCS programs 101. All right. Okay, let's do this. Um, And we're going to start. We'll come back to Conservation Reserve Program. Let's start with NRCS and the key programs they administer. Um, The one that is probably probably tends to be the most familiar to the the most people working in in agriculture is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, often referred to as EQIP. This is a program where a producer, somebody, you know, farmer, rancher, forester, like I mentioned, um, they maybe they've got some sort of a natural resource concern. And this is sort of a term used across the NRCS to help think about what are the natural resources that need conservation on the ground. And so NRCS traces its way back, you know, to the Dust Bowl. I mean, they were originally the Soil Conservation Service. And so soil erosion, whether it's from water or wind, has always been a key natural resource concern. Uh, Wildlife is a resource concern. Plant diversity and plant health is a resource concern. Air quality, um, energy efficiency. These are all these different resource concerns that a producer, like somebody on a working land, might have. And so they would go into their NRCS office and through the EQIP program, they could apply for to have somebody from NRCS come out, look at their farm, talk about the concerns that they might bring. Like maybe they've got an erosion concern. Maybe they're worried about pollinators and they want somebody to come out and say, hey, look, what can we be doing better for pollinators and, you know, native bees, honeybees, butterflies, whatever it might be on our land. And then the planner, the NRCS planner, would work together with that producer through the Environmental Quality Incentives Program to kind of assess the resources on the farm and then come up with specific practices that could be contracted that that producer could implement where they would get a little bit of cost share. It's generally generally designed to be a 50% cost share um, if you're a historically underserved producer. So a new farmer, a woman farmer, a farmer from a BIPOC community, Black, Indigenous, uh, people of color, um, you know, historically underserved farm communities, you can get a 75% coverage of those costs. Oh, wow. But the the heart of EQIP is that there are specific practices that you're going to implement on the ground. Um, And we can talk more about those practices later, but you're basically being paid to implement a practice or two or three for which you sign a contract um, and enter into an agreement with the NRCS or with the federal government. So that's EQIP, the Environmental Incentives Program. Now, that's different from, let's say, the Conservation Stewardship Program, CSP, Conservation Stewardship Program. That's a program that was developed under the Farm Bill, again, uh, that's meant to reward uh, producers 
who are already doing amazing work on their farm. Like they've got a great farm plan where natural resources are really being conserved. They've got a whole suite of practices, you know, that are already being implemented to be sustainable, maybe regenerative, to be um, protecting all of those, you know, those resource concerns of air, water, plants, animals, energy, et cetera, right? And you go through an assessment process where NRCS determines that, hey, yeah, look, you're doing a bunch of great stuff. And through that program, if you qualify based on that assessment, you are given a payment per acre of your farm enrolled. So across your whole farm. And then on top of that, to maintain your CSP status, you also you know, have to take on um, some additional conservation work. They call them enhancements. So they're practices under EQIP. They are enhancements under CSP, and they tend to be closely related now. Um, they tend to be, they tend to link together. And you receive a, an additional payment um, on top of that, you know, per acre, pardon me, on top of that per acre base payment, an additional payment to implement those enhancements. And those enhancements might include pollinator habitat, hedgerows, um, prescribed grazing plans for pastures that are designed to lead to more bloom and these sorts of things. So that's the conservation stewardship program in a nutshell. So you've got EQIP, you've got CSP. Okay. And then <laughs> we've got the easement programs. And the easement programs have seen some evolution over the years. Some of your listeners may have heard of WRP, the Wetland Reserve Program. Um, there's been WREP, the Wetland Reserve Enhancement Program, the Grassland Reserves Program. There are a whole suite of these programs that are all built around easements, and they're currently under the umbrella of ASEP, the Ag Conservation Easement Program. And through this, land is uh, taken out of production, set aside, um, and restored for restored and managed for their natural resources. Um, that's the goal of this program. And so how it rolls out varies depending upon if it's wetlands or grasslands. Um, but the heart of it in this case is that NRCS takes a significant role in helping to manage those easements, often working with partners. And um, if the easement is a permanent easement, NRCS covers 100% of the costs of restoration for that easement. If it's a 30-year easement, I forget what that percentage is, but they, they cover less than 100%. Um, so they're investing more if it's an easement that they can count on in perpetuity. And then the goal there is these tend to be very highly valuable lands from a conservation perspective. You know, wetlands are highly valuable, intact grasslands and native range, some of these rangelands and grasslands that are out there. Again, where I've got high biodiversity, high ecological value um, that are then able to be managed very specifically for those natural resources. And sometimes there are hiccups with this, but the heart of the program is either taking that land out of production or ensuring that it's going to stay, for example, in a wetland with high ecological integrity, you know, for in perpetuity. So if I, if I get this straight, there's almost, it almost appears as the programs are um, in some ways a continuum. So an equip, uh, some a producer who's going to be investing in equip may be doing some environmental, uh, some practices uh, on their, uh, on their farm to sort of bring, you know, deal with some, some small issues. The conservation stewardship program is for somebody who may have like a much more comprehensive role. You know, conservation is taking a much bigger role on their farm. And the easement program is really focused on taking land that's kind of targeted and of high conservation value and making investments to make it like a rather it's not a working farm anymore, but it's kind of like a working conservation program. Did it, is that kind of is that a correct kind of characterization of it? I think it's a fair summary. Okay. And certainly EQIP and CSP were built that way with the idea of CSP is, hey, if you've been working with us for a number of years under the EQIP program, maybe you've achieved some new status. And, you know, the, the overall framework is, hey, we want to reward you for doing all that great work and help you uh -huh. cover the cost of maintaining that in a way. Right. Like you're maybe implementing all that conservation comes at, you know, some expense. And so and time and energy and. It's, it was really initially meant to be sort of that reward, actually. And if you go way back to really target conservation 
it used to be targeted towards specific specific um, uh, watersheds. It used to be kind of a watershed based program where it was meant to also be a way to say, hey, we're going to target our energy here in this area that has a high need or seen as value. And that's we've moved away from that. So I don't I apologize. That may confuse people a bit. Um, but if you go back to its roots, it had some watershed based goals as well. But now it's broadly distributed and it's really meant to kind of help reward those folks who've already adopted a lot of great, a lot of great conservation on their farm or ranch. Well, that's fantastic. That's a great, that's a great one-on-one. Thanks so much. I'll have to re-listen to that. <laughs> you know what, Andy, we can't leave out CRP. We should go back oh, to yes. CRP, the Conservation Reserve Program, okay. even though financially that's administered by the Farm Service Agency, and RCS provides all the technical guidance for it. Um, and it's a little bit different in that this is a program, uh, it was actually one of the, the first conservation program under the Farm Bill back in, I want to say, 1986, the goal of it is to pull out kind of highly erodible lands or lands considered of high value for protecting particularly water quality. So it was a lot of slopes around streams and rivers. Um, originally, it's, you know, it's meant to be land that's seen as potentially low value for agriculture, high value for protecting uh, soil and water resources and wildlife too. Don't get me wrong. And the goal here is um, you enter usually into a 10 year, sometimes 15 but usually a 10-year contract, and then you are paid a per acre payment for the land that you've pulled out um, and also given some additional incentives to um, implement uh, put particular conservation practices on the ground. And sometimes these are just to hold soil. It's just putting a bunch of native grass on the ground and calling it good. But sometimes you can get paid a little bit more to create really high quality pollinator habitat under the pollinator um, uh, conservation practice, CP42. Um, or you might, um, you know, implement bird habitat or do bottomland hardwoods. I mean, there are a number of specific conservation practices there, but the heart of it is that it's a it's a sort of a temporary land retirement program where, where land's pulled out of production and put into some sort of cover that's really meant to address certainly soil and water conservation, but then I, ideally additionally additional benefits above and beyond that. You know, I remember there's some work by uh, Clint Otto with the U.S. Geological Service a survey. And he uh, pointed out that this had traditionally been a very important program for beekeepers, uh, but that over time, um, some of those lands haven't been enrolled for whatever reason. Uh, but that the, the CRP program in the, in the Great Plains has been a real uh, boon to the beekeeping industry who, you know, a large number of colonies move in to that area. Oh, absolutely. I mean, CRP has been huge for, yeah, huge for beekeepers, huge for that old community. And Clint's work really made that clear, or really Clint's work really makes that clear. Um, and the, the ups and downs of CRP relate, frankly, directly to the farm bill um, and actually indirectly to commodity prices for things like corn and soybeans. Um, if we go back and I'm going to, I might mistake the year. I want to say if we go back to the late nineties, we had under the farm bill, an overall cap for CRP conservation reserve program at 36 million acres. Um, and in the 2008 farm bill, at that point, the cap was set at 29 million acres in the 2014 farm bill that was dropped again, because we were seeing a huge spike in um, in prices for corn and soybeans. So farmers wanted to take a lot of land out of CRP and put it into corn and soy, even marginal land that really was not super productive. Um, and as a result, there was not a lot of political pressure to maintain that high acreage cap. And it dropped another 5 million acres down to 24 million. So to go from 36 million to 24 million over the course of a decade or so, that's a huge drop. And that was land, as you suggested, that was really critical, um, really critical summering ground for beekeepers and especially in North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, maybe Eastern Montana, down through the rest of the Great Plains. Um, yeah, that's a 
a real a real challenge. That's now back gone back up to twenty nine million. Um, actually, I think the back. So I'm sorry, it went from thirty six down to the low thirties to twenty four, and now we are back. Based thanks to the twenty eighteen farm bill, we're now back up to twenty nine million and slowly trying to creep our acreage count up. I suppose it's difficult with some of these programs because they off, you know, they often serve dual purposes, being price support at the same time when prices are low. Uh, trying to create revenue that you know seems to have a good marriage with conservation outcomes, but that it has that kind of d- d- dynamic with um, with commodity prices. I think that's right, and they're exclusively voluntary programs. So you know, no one's mandating that somebody goes out there and enroll in CRP or enroll in Equip. These are all voluntary, you know, all voluntary. Um, and so you know that lends its its own challenges. Um, and there are all sorts of challenges too around how do you how much do you price it per acre for CRP and have it be fair with the farm community and not undercut you know farm prices like farmland prices and things like that. I mean, there's just a lot of we're really talking about this at a very high level, and there's a lot of politics and a lot of detail policy issues, you know, just one step below that that make it even more complicated. But for now, just understanding these different caps, I, um, I think it's helpful for understanding where we are with, say, Bee Forge, for example, across the U.S. I just want to, before we take a break, I just want to shift over to one thing that you mentioned about the programs and just to get a, a broad overview um, so you talked about enhancements with the stewardship program and practices with the equip program. Um, can you just give me, you know, h- uh, how these practices and enhancements may serve pollinators? Because I imagine, like you say, they're also some of them may be doing water quality, soil erosion. Tell me about how some of those can plug into specifically uh, creating habitat for pollinators. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And in fact, I mean, this has been the heart of my work for Going back to 2004, I mean, recognizing the potential of all these conservation programs to be providing at the very least, ideally, you know, technical assistance, if not financial assistance to get pollinator habitat on the ground. I started this collaboration with NRCS back in 2004 um, and have continued to work with the agency since then. And, you know, we've seen over a million and a quarter um, uh, acres of habitat go on the ground through these different practices and enhancements over the last decade or so. So, I mean, there's just huge potential here. If we look at those practices and enhancements, they can include a whole range of different things. So, for example, uh, with our work in California, where land is really high value, um, hedgerows, um, and we've got really droughty conditions and where water resources are really scarce, hedgerows become a key practice that we implement a lot of. I mean, we've with NRCS and the different work, like the work we've been doing with them, We've got over 100, 125 miles of hedgerows that have gone on the ground in the oh, last wow. decade down there, um, designed for pollinators. And so, you know, you could get a per linear foot payments to create a diverse hedgerow with a variety of shrubs, even some wildflowers in there designed for pollinators. Um, there is a practice, uh, and that's, you know, everything's got a code. It's federal government, it's bureaucracy, so everything's got to have a number. So that's 422, the hedgerow practice. Um, <laughs> there's also a practice called wildlife habitat establishment or wildlife habitat planting practice 420. And this is one geared towards planting maybe a meadow or a prairie, some sort of permanent, more herbaceous habitat on the ground. There's a field border practice where maybe you've got a strip or maybe you've got a pivot corner, you know, um, in an ag field that's not planted to a crop where you want to put something on there that's, you know, going to help keep the weeds out and support pollinators. You might use the field border practice 386. You might use a cover crop. One thing that For a lot of farms, if you want to break pest cycles, if you want to put down something cheap that, you know, is not a long term commitment, but where you want to get something on the ground that's blooming, where you could be building soil carbon, um, but also feeding some bees and other beneficial insects, you could contract the cover crop practice 340. Um, and put that on the ground. Um, you could contract herbaceous weed control to try to get bad weeds out of your farm. Um, there are management practices. Upland wildlife habitat management is 645 and declining species 
um, uh, management is 643. These are management practices where you can develop a little more comprehensive plan to maybe, um, let's say if you're here in Oregon, you know, put some oak savanna back on the ground or help restore or enhance or improve, let's use improve not to be confusing, um, some oak savanna habitat for pollinators and wildlife and just overall biodiversity. Oh, so in those practices, it's more comprehensive. It's kind of like I'm going to rather than a hedgerow or a cover crop, you're going to actually take a, a piece of habitat on your land and perhaps bring it up to the level that it was uh, before development. Exactly. Huh. Exactly. Interesting. Um, and a couple, and then you, there are other little practices you can do. You can develop a grazing management plan that maybe allows for more rest where you're going to get at. Again, all these involve some sort of a per acre or per linear foot, um, you know, payment, maybe a grazing management plan that allows that is designed for improved range or pasture health, but also designed to allow some, you know, more bloom to happen. Maybe it's some fencing to keep, you know, livestock out of riparian areas, or maybe it's one of the riparian practices herbaceous or woody plantings where you're doing restoration along streams and actually putting, improving the habitat, adding pollinator plants, you know, along stream corridors that's designed ideally from my perspective to do multiple benefits, right? Pollinator habitat, stream shading, uh, stream bank stabilization. Ideally, we do these practices in a way that we're supporting pollinators, but also improving water quality, stopping erosion, um, you know, supporting other wildlife, et cetera. I'll add one last thing. I've described all these practices, quote unquote, under EQIP. Under CSP, they're often just grabbing these same practices and calling them enhancements and tying. Sometimes under CSP, things get a little more specific. For example, there may be a monarch butterfly specific enhancement or a beneficial insect specific enhancement. Sometimes they drill down a little bit deeper under the CSP program, but they're really closely related at this point. And so there's a if you understand the equip practices um, and you can go online and actually look at these. And one of the links will set up in the in the for this for this podcast one of the links we'll set up will be a link to a, a set of guidelines I developed several years ago on how to use farm bill programs for pollinator conservation. And it provides a really nice and succinct summary of all those programs we talked about just now, as well as all these different practices and enhancements. Um, and even under CRP, the different conservation practices under CRP, because not to confuse matters, but those are different too. Okay, and just to put a fine point on this, so for the um, when looking at enhancement and practices between the two programs, enhancements may have just a little bit more specificity to them, but they're gonna there's gonna be a, a parallel between these. A hedgerow for uh, uh, the stewardship program is gonna be you know is gonna have the same kind of like there'll be some overlap in those guidance. So somebody who's been doing equip and wanted to maybe transition to doing the conservation stewardship program, they'll be familiar. It's not like a big quantum jump or something. Yeah. And that's, um, yeah, that's very much been on purpose just in the last five or 10 years to help people get their head around. What is it that I'm looking at doing? <laughs> like, What's going on? We want, you know, they, I think rightly so wanted some continuity there. So if you've been working with one, when you, one program, when you switch to another, you can kind of recognize the roots of things and get it, have a sense of, yeah. Yeah. Just what you said. You said like, Oh yeah, I see where this comes from. Fantastic, Mace. Let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and, and um, just maybe get it, uh, in a little bit more to the uh, activities that are going on here in Oregon. Okay, great. I always love having those conversations between the breaks. And one thing that I, you know, um, that we were talking about is that there, you know, there is there are practices specific to habitat, but there are also practices um, uh, developed for protecting uh, bees from things like pesticide exposure. Can you tell us a little bit about um, those practices? Yeah, there's practice. a one of the practices under EQIP um, number five nine five is called pest management conservation system, and the goal of this practice is to well the the traditional goal of the pest management conservation system. I'm just going to call it five nine five. I apologize for that, but it's easier to say um, <laughs> the key goal of 595 traditionally has been water quality protection. So there are tools in place within NRCS to help evaluate the risks to drinking water and to fish habitat. Um, 
um, you know, of pesticide use, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, et cetera, to adjacent waterways. Over time, many of us have recognized that 595 also could be used to help reduce risks to honeybees, native bees, beneficial insects that are helping to, you know, attack crop pests, for example. Um, and so there's been an effort to try to understand and support um, the implementation of this practice to, yeah, to help, you know, still make sure that farmers aren't losing a crop to their pests, but to give them some support as they might adopt um, reduced risk practices, like, say, mating disruption, where they're putting out pheromones that um, that help um, interrupt the ability of pest insects to find their mates in the field, which really drops down, uh, has the potential, if used at a big scale, to drop down lower pest pressure. Um, or maybe it's supporting um, practices that, you know, where we're spraying pesticides at a time of day that's least impactful or um, creating barriers to prevent drift off site or on site onto a farm um, or, you know, just a whole suite of different things, you know, setting the creating setbacks into crop fields where we don't spray the edges of a field in order to protect maybe some adjacent habitat. So 595, this pest management conservation system practice, in theory, can be used for all these things. It's a pretty complicated one to um, for the NRCS to contract, and so it's a little hard. It's where cooperative extension actually plays a huge role. The NRCS um, is not allowed to make any sort of pesticide recommendations, but if cooperative extension says, hey, we've got a new tool or a new pesticide, for example, that is much lower risk to all those beneficials, um, you know, it's possible that Cooperative Extension could work with the landowner and NRCS to outline what this new practice might look like on the farm, this new pest management practice might look like on the farm. And then there's potential to get some contracted financial assistance to help cover what might be increased costs or the costs of adoption, where you've got to learn and figure it all out. Um, that is possible under EQIP through the 595 practice. It's an exciting program for me as an extension uh, specialist because I can just imagine, you know, getting the ball rolling with a new technology that has lower impacts on on pollinators. They, you know, the growers may need a little bit of, um, you know, cost share um, assistance and that, you know, we can imagine it ramps up and then maybe it's no longer it's just the standard practice. Everybody uses mating disruption because of that initial investment in this um, practice kind of like helps us roll it out. Yeah, and I think that's very much the goal of the practice, um, just because taking on anything new. In fact, it's really the role of all of these um, conservation practices. Ideally, when you adopt them and you get some financial assistance to cover that adoption, it becomes something that you that the landowners figured out. They got their head around it, um, and implementing it is becomes just part of the operation and not an extra or undue cost. You know, it's something that yeah, this is worthwhile. We're maintaining farm production, if not increasing it, and meeting all these other goals as well. Fantastic. Thanks for that little detour. But I, <laughs> I want to come back over with something you mentioned earlier on I wanted to take up again. Um, each time there's a farm bill, uh, there seems to be a, a, a kind of subtle change, and sometimes that's lost on me and others. Uh, but the NRCS programs seem to kind of around pollinators seem to change. And it seems like most recently the farm bill, um, due to a lot of, you know, pushing and um, in a lot of pressure changed again. So could you explain how this works, the connection between the farm uh, farm bill and how the last farm bill, you know, how it changed uh, the pollinator programs um, specifically or the, yeah. the focus of pollinators? Let's go, let's go back. We're going to go back a couple of steps, actually, just as for a big picture for your listeners. You know, we get a new farm bill every, say, five years or so. Um, and there are lots of changes on all these all those different elements that I mentioned before in terms of food, food, food support for for low income families, conservation, uh, uh, support for farmers, you know, risk like risk reduction for farmers and crop insurance and things like that. Also, research. I forgot to mention uh -huh. a lot of funding for research. 
So if we go back to the 2008 Farm Bill, you know, we were just coming out of these first few years of colony collapse disorder. We've been seeing, starting to see these declines in monarch butterflies and in bumblebees and a whole suite of different things. And so Xerxes worked pretty hard with um, Senator Boxer's office in California, Senator Blumen, I mean, uh, Congressman Blumenauer's office here in Portland, and were able to get into the 2008 Farm Bill, you know, some specific language that made prior, pollinators a priority Priority, one of the conservation priorities for the Farm Bill Conservation Programs, and also set up um, an expanded support for pollinator research, honeybees and native bees, in terms of their role in crop per- per- pollination and thinking about things that we could do to help either so, you know, support or enhance that service. So the 2008 Farm Bill was a huge one for pollinators. It completely elevated the potential and the expectation that the NRCS, for example, would be taking on pollinators in a big way. We go if we go forward five or six years to the 2014 Farm Bill. As I mentioned earlier, we saw that reduction in the uh, CRP acreage cap. That was a big hit. Um, but at the same time, some great things happened for beekeepers um, in the 2014 Farm Bill. There was a renewed emphasis and a spotlight on habitat for honeybee habitat in the northern Great Plains. So that core area where so many beekeepers take their hives to over summer to put on a honey crop and get healthy and sort of rebound after moving around for pollination contracts. Also, it set up um, beekeepers to be eligible for crop insurance, quote unquote, if they have big hive losses for a variety of reasons. So those are a couple of big changes in the 2014 Farm Bill. And if we go ahead now four more years to the 2018 Farm Bill, probably the biggest change there and the most important thing for pollinators was USDA set up a new position within the office of the chief scientist, um, a new position that was in charge of overseeing and tracking all of the research and some conservation, but mostly all the research and work going on for pollinators across the country and trying to figure out how best to support that and, and keep that going on. Throughout all of this, that priority with under EQIP and CSP and CRP, that priority for pollinators has been maintained. So this is still a resource concern of high, you know, of high value, high importance to NRCS and the Farm Service Agency. And so that element in law, um, in statute of the Farm Bill is still there and something that every time there's a new Farm Bill, that's one of the most important things I track just to make sure that that stays in place. You know, I, I will put this in the show notes. I, I've really enjoyed um the new position with USDA. And I know uh, for people who don't know, there's a periodic newsletter that now comes out, the latest buzz. It's a real uh, treasure trove of information of what's going on around with, uh, with pollinators around the U S I'll, I'll put a link to how you can sign up, but it's a real um, anyways. So lots of things happen in, in, in it, it kind of builds off of different pressures that are happening uh, in society, uh, and, and a, a farm bill must have so many different interest groups, uh, at the table, uh, coming up with something that is agreeable to everybody must be a tricky, tricky business, but <laughs> it's, oh, it's so hard. And that's where actually pollinators were really nice. It was a, an issue that was bipartisan, non-controversial kind of floated above a lot, like the, you know, like so much of the politics out there and was something that everybody could get behind. Um, you know, there are some other things out there that I'd like to see. Oh, actually, one other huge change in the last farm bill was that it used to be 5% of EQIP dollars had to go to wildlife conservation. And one big win for pollinators is that that got bumped from 5% of those hundreds of millions of dollars to 10%. Wow. So that meant a doubling of funding for wildlife practices of which pollinators are considered one. Now that could be fish and deer and sage grouse and prairie chicken and, you know, bog turtle. That can be a whole suite of different wildlife species, um, but pollinators are definitely included. And, you know, sometimes it's nice if an NRCS office can, you know, add a bunch of cover crop to their list of things, or uh, they probably do it through a different practice. But, you know, if they can have pollinators give the NRCS state offices some additional flexibility in terms of what they can report up the line that's gone on the ground for, for wildlife. So that's another really key change to the last farm bill that, um, yeah, you know, kind of was a, you know, got at some of those politics that are a real challenge. 
Fantastic. Yep. This, this is great. I want to now zoom right into Oregon and another initiative that I know the Xerces Society has been very uh, pivotal in bringing about uh, has been um, a new NRCS program in the mid-Columbia region focused on pollinators and other, other beneficial insects. Can you uh, describe um, what that what is a conservation innovation strategy? And, Close. Uh, <laughs> so Oregon does things, Oregon often, Oregon NRCS often has done things a little bit different. They've been very focused over the years on watershed planning or regional planning. Um, there's been a, um, oh, a critique of NRCS over the years that it's a lot of quote unquote sort of random acts of conservation. Uh-huh. Um and, and Oregon NRCS many years ago decided to go down a route where they wanted to really try to target um, target their resources in a particular area around a particular resource concern to try to you know have a measurable impact, a measurable benefit. And that overall strategy is now called um, those are now called conservation implementation strategies. Um, so you're close. You're close. Um, and um, there are many of them across Oregon that are really designed to focus, for example, you know, on oak savanna or on fire risk reduction or on deer management or, you know, soil erosion under hazelnuts. There are a number of these different what I call CISs, conservation implementation strategies. And it's just a way to target equip dollars. So we're focused on the equip program. Yeah target equip dollars on the ground. And so working closely with um, folks at the Oregon NRCS state office, as well as with their field offices in Wasco, which is the Dalles area and Hood River counties, we worked with those field offices and the state office to develop a conservation implementation strategy for the Columbia uh, Basin, mid-Columbia Basin for food crops there. So this is a specific program. It means it's a specific set of funds that are set aside by the state that are targeting and available for um, fruit producers in that in those two counties, in those two sort of basins or watersheds. So, you know, if you, um, for example, you know, I'm trying to remember that I'm trying to I want to get think get the criteria in my head. Um You know, if you've got land that is within 500 feet of a focal crop, so cherries, uh, blueberries, vineyards, apple, pear, um, maybe other stone fruit that's being grown in that area, that helps you then be eligible for getting additional funding to implement things like the practices we've talked about before, hedgerows, wildlife habitat, cover crops, uh, field borders, maybe windbreaks, um, a whole suite of different practices that would be geared towards supporting the pollinators of those fruit crops. Um, also, vineyards roll in there too. Grapes don't need a pollinator necessarily, but hey, if you've got a vineyard in the Hood River or Dalles area, you know, that's, that's still a fruit crop that would, you know, where you would be able to enroll. And it just strikes me, I, I, we had uh, 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 Core and Peace uh, from uh, Xerces Society and NRCS on a previous episode uh, who comes from a vineyard background. There's a lot of vineyard pollinator habitat. I've just It just seems to pop up all, you know, I, I get an, another post or another news story of somebody trying it in, in vineyards. So even though they don't know, need bees, they seem to be keying into this issue. Well, I think they really like it. I think they've got some, their management systems often lend themselves to being able to do this. Plus, we often, when Xerces and NRCS are working with vineyard owners, we're often too thinking about what can we do in terms of supporting beneficial insects that might be attacking crop pests, you know, attacking those grape pests. So that's another thing. Like a lot of times when we build quote unquote pollinator habitat, we can design that to feed parasitoids, tiny little wasps or flies that are attacking pests or the big predators like wasps that are you know getting there and eating cabbage looper or all these different things that might be out there i mean not cabbage looper wouldn't be in a vineyard but you know other soft body pests that are out there these often overlap nicely and sometimes the primary driver is more um, supporting beneficial insects that are attacking crop pests than it is supporting crop pollinators themselves all right, may, just to put a bow on this section. So let's say I'm a fruit grower or let's say I'm a hazelnut grower or a grass seed grower. Let's say I'm on the coast and coastal cranberries or I'm 
I have a, a woodland that I'm managing. How do I get the ball rolling? How do I, you know, I want to do pollinator habitat. How do I get started? What's my first step? Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing that you, the, the first thing you need to do, frankly, is just step into, you know, your a local service center office. Like um, COVID, the staffing in those offices has often been reduced. So you could try to give them a call or stopping in, but looking up your local USDA service center, and we can put a link um, into the, and I'm sure to attach to this podcast to help you find a way to connect directly to your local service center um, and talk to somebody. There are a number of criteria that need to be met. Um, you know, you've got to have, uh, you got to, meet certain um, uh, income requirements. Like if you're making, if you're too big of an operation and you're making too much money, you tend not to qualify. This tends to be for small to midsize, you know, some large farms, but there are some income caps um, so we can get resources where they're needed, you know, to, by the folks who really need them. Um, and there's an application process that you would get started on, but it's always best just to start by talking to somebody, uh, somebody from the NRCS in your local field office. For example, if you're in Wasco or Hood River, you know, it's going into the Dallas field office or the Hood River field offices up in Parkdale with Forest Service, you know, going in and just talking to folks there to get the ball rolling and figure out what you need to do. You don't necessarily need to enroll and file a whole bunch of paperwork. Um, to, you don't have to just to go for financial support. You can also go in and talk with them just about getting some technical advice on what's going on your farm and just chatting with them. You know, there's no paperwork for that. Um, it's something that they're geared up to do. And if it's in an area that has partner staff, like my staff, sometimes you can get, you know, some advice from a Xerces person that way, um, or they may just be able to tap into local resources. You know, they may be able to reach out to Anthony if they're in Oregon um, and, and make a connection there and get some advice. You know, they, and there's so many resources. A number of them are, are, uh, are um, done cooperatively with uh, the Xerces Society, but I also, you know, I was just picking up the other day uh, uh, from the Plant Materials Center, just all the native plants. And if you want to become a seed producer, um, you know, what are the criteria? There's a lot of resources in NRCS uh, on how to, you know, pull these things off. Indeed. I mean, that's the, been the great thing about working with them is they've got a whole the technical folks at NRCS are just top notch. They're trying to do the best science, best understand how to successfully create habitat, get the materials together to support that habitat. Um, you've got the plant material centers you mentioned. There are regional technology support centers, which is where I'm based part time here in Portland, Oregon, supporting states across the all across the you know the West in my case, and actually and throughout the whole country. But also they're really good and they try to connect with, and certainly we help foster connections with land grant universities and other researchers to really try to bring the best information together. So I, yeah, it's key to go in and, st and ask them, the more people are going into these offices to ask about technical and financial support, you know, the better it really drives a lot of this work. Well, thank you so much, Mace. That is, this is a lot of information I know, but I think it it's laid out. You, I, I imagine you can talk about these things in your sleep. You really live and breathe this world. Uh, we really appreciate you taking time um, to kind of fill us in. But before you go, we have these three questions. I'm so, I'm so curious what your answers are going to be. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, which one do you want to start with? Well, before we start, let's take a quick break. Okay. Just give our listeners a chance to brew some coffee and we'll come back. And here we go in a few minutes. Sounds great. Okay, we're back. So three questions. I'm so curious what your answer is going to be. So the first one, and I have to say, uh, is book recommendation. And I think the two Xerces books, the one on pollinator habitat and the other one on beneficial ben, pollinator habitat and beneficial insects, but also the 25 plants for, no, is it 25? 100. 100. There's so many, so many recommendations our guests have or Xerces books. So, um, 
what's your book recommendation as someone from Xerxes? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I felt like don't have a moral obligation to, to say, hey, go check out our books. Um, they're fantastic, though. They're they're really the, what I think our guests always love about them is they're nicely laid out just in the same way as in this podcast. If you want to build habitat, what are some of the key principles? It just the brass tacks. It gets it gets down to business, which I always appreciate in a book. Well, thanks for that. And that's, yeah, that's really, I really appreciate that. Thanks for letting me know. And I'm really glad that those stay useful. Um, but I did think, I, I thought long and hard about this. Um, and particularly in light of this conversation and in light of the fact that, I mean, let's face it, I feel like it's been a challenging time in the last year and a half as we're looking at all the issues facing us and what helps keep me, I don't know, a little bit rooted and inspired. Um, I'm going to go old school with my book recommendation, particularly in light of this conversation on working on farmland and rangeland and forests is, believe it or not, I've been going back to Aldo Leopold. Oh, I don't really? know if anyone, yeah, Sand County, Almanac, Round River. Um, these books to me, they're not pollinator specific, but they get at this why they get it, why I do this work. They get it, why I see potential in using the tools of working lands, you know, being out there and thinking about the value and the role and the potential for habitat on farmland and on rangeland and in and around forests. You know, thinking about, you know, just it's it's been more for inspiration lately that, you know, if we go back to the mid 40s, you know, Aldo Leopold was thinking about this, having some of the same concerns we have today. And I worry what he would think if he saw what a lot of our a lot of our farm and range look like. But the flip side is he might be pretty inspired by, you know, what landowners can do and have been doing when they've set their mind to it. And just being reminded about the blooming of prairies or, you know, a classic quote from Round River that goes way back in Xerxes' time where um, thinking about how, oh, shoot, well, I'm trying to remember what it was exactly, but, you know, the first rule of any tinkering, and tinkering in this case being, you know, any sort of managing or working with the land to try to conserve it, is protecting and keeping all of the pieces. And for invertebrate conservation, for pollinator conservation, you know, people often ask, well, why is this bee important? Or why is that butterfly important? Why should I care? And I think even 60, 70 years ago, he so succinctly, you know, set up the case for, hey, we need to keep and protect, preserve, um, and manage for all of these species because who knows what their ultimate value is. And maybe their, their value is purely aesthetic in the end. Maybe it's that they become, maybe they're a key driver of an ecosystem. You know, there is value in keeping them all. And so for me, when times have been hard and thinking about the work that I do on these working lands, going back to Sand County, Albanac is, you know, it's a little grounding um, and gives me some hope. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, that for me has been something that I've found helpful as and and thought provoking. Now it's a little dated, um, but well, there's still so much there at the heart of it that is about love of the land and serving as as a good friend and mentor of mine would call it serving as a land doctor. How do we provide healthcare services to the environment in some of the places where it needs it the most? Well, you know, I see his name brought up you know, in the last decade, a lot around adaptive management, in some ways, the whole kind of principle of, you know, having these, you know, thinking about the whole system and trying to, uh, but also, you know, the focus, I love, you know, the focus on working lands and knowing that, you know, the old style of conservation of like setting, which still, of course, is absolutely critical of setting some yeah. land aside and not touching it, um, you know, uh, it is it is a, a valuable piece of any conservation strategy. I agree. I mean, we have to feed we have to feed all of us. We have to take care of all of us. So can we do that in a way that's regenerative of the land, regenerative of diversity in the landscape and a good counterpart to all those natural and high value protected areas that are so critically important to well, my next question, I'm kind of curious about for you because it's what's your favorite tool for working on pollinators? And I kind of think of you as like the jackknife of pollinator 
you kind of like have you got a can opener and you got the scissor, you got the corkscrew, like it's all in the Mace Bond kind of package. So I'm curious if you have a one tool that you kind of you could identify that you rely on. I had a hard time making it one, so am I allowed to have a couple? Okay. So first and foremost, actually, let's go to the jackknife. Actually, having a jackknife is very useful if you want to break open stems to be able to show people tunnel nesting bees. Like if you go out in the field and you've got some gloves and you grab some Himalayan blackberry stems that have been cut down and you want to cut into a stem to show people the bees in there, or if you've got elderberry and you can see some holes cut like dug out into the pith, a little jackknife is useful for that. But that wasn't the first one that was on my mind, but it has its utility. Um, for me, I have to say my old John Rose entomology three foot net with a fine mesh bag. I am a big fan fan of that. I mean, that net, that net is weighted so well. It is balanced perfectly. (laughs) And for me to be able to grab a bee or a butterfly at a flower, put it into a little vial or carefully hold it to show people pollinators up close for me, when I first I started, I got into all this as a beekeeper where all of a sudden, like 30 years ago, I was looking at bees on flowers and seeing them up close and seeing how beautiful they were and seeing the diversity that was out there. So a good net to be able to grab that, put, put a little bee in a little clear plastic vial, show people um, what it is we're trying to protect. For me, that's probably been my favorite tool. Um, in that same vein, and I, I lost this a, a number of years ago and need to get myself a new one. Close focusing binoculars end up doing the same thing where, again, you know, that ability to in the field, look at these animals on the flower up close um, to me just brings such joy because it's like, oh, here's this wildlife, this life. Like, it's not just flowers. It's not just a shrub with flowers or a wildflower. There is life on this. And to be able to look at those closely without disturbing them, to be able to see their behavior, for me, that's been pretty fun. So close focus binoculars, John Rose entomology net, which I think you can only get them from BioQuip these days, um, some plastic vials. I don't know. I'm a big fan of being able to look at things up close and then, you know, I'm not I'm not a big collector. I'm not a collector. I just want to observe these things in nature. And it's pretty fun for me. So those are my picks. Well, that leads so perfectly into the last question. So when you're tooting around there and catching things and maybe using your binoculars to see things, is there a pollinator species that you come across that, you know, always kind of brings joy to your heart? I imagine they all do. This is all a tough question for, but um, is there anybody specifically you sort of hoping to see? I suppose there's an element of having a hard time picking your favorite kid. Um, (laughs) But in this case, I think I do have an answer. And for me, drum roll, it's <laughs> leaf cutter bees. And I'll tell you why. So leaf cutter bees is a tremendous variety out there. Um, when you see them on the flower with that pollen packed on the underside of their abdomen, when you kind of poke them a little bit and then mm-hmm. the abdomen goes up in the air, almost like a scorpion, they've got the big head and the big jaws and they are full. They just, they're a little bit pugnacious. They're, they've got a little bit of attitude. They do. Um, there's a, you know, to compl- like to totally personify this bee, which I know from a scientific perspective is probably not ideal, but to totally personify this thing, they have a lot of personality. And on top of that, I find great joy in seeing evidence of their work. So looking at the roses, the snowberry, the red bud, the um, shoot, the uh, spirea in my yard, in nature, to go out and to see ovals and to see circles cut from the leaf margins to me is the sign that even though I can't see the bee, I know that they are around and I know they're present um, and I know they're out there. And so what I like about it is not only is the bee itself full of this personality um, and also beautiful with the pollen on the underside of the abdomen and often the nice stripes and, you know, some of them with the fuzzy legs. I mean, there's all sorts of coolness to them as an individual bee. But to see that evidence of them in your garden or in nature, um, I find that very satisfying and very cool. That's a fantastic answer, and uh, I, I have to say probably is well um, one of the favorite bee genera for me as as well. So 
But anyways, thank you so much for taking uh, time out of your day. This is going to be a podcast, I think, for a lot of people who are interested in conservation are going to be re-listening to and re-listening to. And we will have resources in the show notes. But I want to, on behalf of all our listeners, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. Oh, thanks, Anthony. I really, really, it's a real honor to be on. Um, And this podcast is just a fantastic podcast. So thank you so much. Really appreciate being here. Thank you so much for listening. The show is produced by Quinn Sin and Neil, who's a student here at OSU in the New Media Communications Program. And the show wouldn't even be possible without the support of the Oregon Legislature, the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, and Western SER. Show notes with links mentioned on each episode are available on the website, which is at pollinationpodcast.oregonstate.edu. I also love hearing from you, and there's several ways to connect with me. The first one is you can visit the website and leave an episode-specific comment. You can suggest a future guest or topic or ask a question that could be featured in a future episode. But you can do the same things on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook by visiting the Oregon Bee Project. Thanks so much for listening, and see you next week.